Hello everyone and welcome to Climate Australia. My name is Lee Constable and I'll be your host and this is the first episode of Climate Australia. I'd like to start as I mean to go on by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I am right now broadcasting to you around Australia and the world. I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Turrbal and Yugara people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and also acknowledge emerging leaders within the community. I'd also like to use this opportunity, given this is a channel all about climate change and the environment, to acknowledge the part that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have played in environmental custodianship for tens of thousands of years. And with that said, I'd also like to introduce our first guest for the first episode. Anika Molesworth is many things. I'll tell you a few of them before we cross to her. So Anika Molesworth is an agroecologist, a farmer, a science communicator, a climate action advocate, one of the founding members of an Australian organization called Farmers for Climate Action, and more. She's also just this close to being Dr. Anika Molesworth. <laughs> this close, just through a technicality. She'll be Dr. Anika Molesworth soon, but for now, please welcome Anika Molesworth. Hello. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me part of this, Lee. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to launch this channel. Now, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us where you are right now. I mentioned I'm here in Brisbane and the land of the Turrbal and Yugara people, but where are you? So I'm way out west, in far west in New South Wales, Australia, on my family's sheep and goat property. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, which I live and work, which is the Willakali people. Awesome. So what brought you on this path? I mentioned lots of different titles that, and different roles that you play now, but how did you end up where you are? What's your story? Well, I guess my story starts here where I am on my family's farm. So my parents purchased our property when I was 12 years old in the year 2000. And for anyone who doesn't know far western New South Wales, it is a very beautiful part of the country. It's very raw and challenging in that it is a semi-arid leaning on to more arid these days, uh, environment of, you know, ruby red sands, of sapphire blue skies, endless horizons. They actually say just beyond my family's farm, you can see the curvature of the earth because the red plains just seem to stretch out forever. And, you know, growing up here, I just like fell in love with the place. I mean, there were horses, canoes on the dam, motorbikes to be ridden. It was this incredible playground for myself and my brothers. Um, but for those who don't know, the year 2000 was also the start of the decade long millennium drought here in Australia. And so our introduction to agriculture was quite a steep learning curve. Pretty much the first 10 years, we had little to no rainfall. And it became very quickly apparent to me just how interconnected people are to the land. Um, you know, when the rain stops falling, there's less vegetation on the ground, less water resources. That directly impacts what food and fiber can be produced on farms. That impacts the rural communities. And um, you see people leaving rural towns. It also influences the availability of food, the price of food, the nutritional content of food for everyone. And so it was this tough learning experience of the 10 year long millennium drought that really propelled my interest in climate change because my dream has always been to take on my family's farm. But reading and learning more about climate change, I, it, it's quite sobering to look at the projections for this region for other regions of the globe and think about, well, what, what does that actually mean for the next generation of food producers like myself? And how do we equip ourselves in the best way possible so we actually do have a food secure, vibrant future? I think it's so interesting that you were spurred forth as a farm kid who grew up in the millennium drought because that is identical to me as someone who grew up on a sheep farm in New South Wales, but 
in a totally different region with, with a different landscape to yours, but also a sheep farm, that is exactly what spurred me to go and go into environmental science. So that's great to hear. But as you say, yes, it's a local problem when it comes to climate change. You can definitely see it in your local community and on your local land, but it also is a global issue. So our episode today is, of course, talking about, about you and your work with Farmers for Climate Action here in Australia, but also about um, the global context. So I was wondering if you could give us a bit of an idea of what climate change and agriculture looks like in Australia and how and if that relates to what agriculture and climate change looks like everywhere. Sure. Well, I guess it was from the millennium drought when I started to learn more about these larger global challenges, you know, that we have a rapidly growing global population, which needs to be fed and fed well, uh, with reduced environmental footprint. Now, every 24 hours, we have nearly a quarter of a million new mouths to feed globally. So that's a, a huge pressure for farmers to produce more food, produce it better, with a reduced environmental footprint. So here in Australia, what does climate change mean? Well, it means a lot of different things because Australia has such diverse uh, climates and geographies, such a wide variety of agricultural industries. I mean, we grow tropical fruits and vegetables in the northern regions of the country. We have, um, you know, alpine highland um, cattle in the the snowy eastern areas. We have a Mediterranean climate where we produce grains and grapes for wine. Uh, So climate change, it's a whole lot of things. It's, you know, increased temperature and change rainfall patterns. It's also changing the distribution and prevalence of pests and diseases uh, for both livestock and for crops. It also means increased intensity and uh, frequency of extreme weather events like floods, like droughts, like heat waves. And here in Australia, we can experience those three extreme weather events within a week. That's not uncommon. So Australian farmers are incredibly adaptive and resilient because we are used to living in a very variable and challenging uh, natural climate condition here in this country um, with scarce water resources, with um, you know poor soil nutrients. So we've become quite innovative, which is fantastic. The problem with climate change is the rate and the scale that it's occurring, it's actually very difficult for farmers to actually keep a pace with that. And this is why um, Farmers for Climate Action actually formed because farmers from around the country, from all these different uh, farming sectors, you know, from dairy farmers in, you know, the southern regions of the country to banana growers in the northern region, came together and said, you know, although we're very different in what we're producing and how we're producing it, there are these common threads of challenges because we live and work so closely with the natural environment we are on the front lines of climate change. And so we need to be on the front lines of the solutions as well. So with forming Farmers for Climate Action, obviously it starts this conversation and collaboration between farmers across different climates across Australia. But beyond those conversations, what other sort of work is Farmers for Climate Action doing and and how can that maybe have takeaways for people who are watching who aren't in Australia? Yeah, so Farmers for Climate Action is doing actually a a lot of terrific things because agriculture is very unique on the topic of climate change. We are part of the problem. I mean, we are grazing vegetation. We are part of the deforestation story. We are emitting methane emissions from our livestock. We are using nitrogen fertilizers, which contribute nitrous oxide emissions. We are also one of the most vulnerable and exposed industries to the impacts of climate change. As I said, we are on the front lines of feeling the impacts. We are also an incredibly important part of the solutions. We can't tackle climate change without involving farmers. So Farmers for Climate Action, which is this national organization which formed about five years ago out of a group of 30 farmers meeting and having a chat saying, you know, we feel like not enough is being done and how can we play more of a leading role in this big problem that we face? 
Uh, we now have over 5,000 farming members just in Australia alone. And we're working in various ways. Firstly, we're working with policymakers and industry bodies because we need good uh, climate, energy, agricultural policies so we know where we're going and how we can best get there. That also um, helps with you know, investor certainty. So we see investment into renewable energy projects, you know, investment into science, research, all of that. We're also working in communications. How can farmers sh share their stories better? Because farmers live in you know, these incredible landscapes. They're doing such meaningful work producing food and fiber that's sustaining and nourishing our communities. They are feeling the impacts of climate change a lot of them are doing really innovative things on their farms to reduce emissions, to adapt to changing weather conditions. We want to share those stories. So we're trying to change the narrative that has been all too common in you know, national media, where farmers are portrayed as conservative, anti-climate people, because that's not the case. I actually don't know any farmer who doesn't believe in climate change, to be honest. Uh, so we're trying to actually get these good stories into the media not just about the impacts, but actually, you know, here is an example of what is being done to sequester carbon on a farm, to reduce methane emissions from our livestock, of, you know, renewable energies uh, giving farmers secondary and stable sources of income. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, lastly, we're also working very closely with the scientists, with the experts. So we're running master classes, which brings, you know, world leading climate and environmental experts out to the paddock, to the rural communities, to explain to farmers, you know, these are the projections for your region. This is potentially how you can adapt your farming business. This is potentially how you can reduce emissions from your farming business. That's awesome. And I was just thinking, it, it seems like there's a lot of different um, barriers to break down when it comes to farmers and politics and media and all of the misconceptions between city and country even. Um, so you've obviously got this model where you, oh, my mic just popping into camera there. You've obviously got this model where you not only deal with the grassroots farmers climate solution and problem, but also when you're talking about the broader policy and politics and media side of things. Um, I know that you're not a government organisation, but I just noticed Doug in the chat has brought up another organisation, Landcare, which is a government funded and run program. Um, Doug was wanting to know, are Landcare groups still active where you are? Yeah, absolutely. The Broken Hill Landcare Group is very active and um, we could do a whole episode on talking about what our local landcare group is doing. So Landcare is doing terrific things with uh, community groups, with farmers, with environmentalists, uh, and very similarly working out how do we look after the environment in the best way possible to look after you know, the, the community in the best way possible also. Hmm. And it seems to me... Um you know, through having a family that's quite land care involved or has been quite land care involved in the past, that, that sometimes government funding, you know, goes up and down for land care. Is that something that you think is an advantage of having something like climate, uh, Farmers for Climate Action as well as groups like land care that you kind of can work together but also separately? Yeah, look, I think that's that's the key. What you say there is working together. So we've got, you know, all these different groups, organisations around the country, around the world, which are doing terrific things in tackling climate change, in looking after the environment, in bringing the community along. But we can't just work in fragmented efforts. And, you know, there are limited resource pools in terms of, you know, money available, um, you know, hardworking people available. So if we work fragmentedly, we're always going to be less efficient. We're always going to be, you know, leaking resources. So in times like these, where the challenges are very big, where they're happening very quickly, we need to be pooling our knowledge, our resources, our skills to be most effective. And so that means groups like Farmers for Climate Action works very closely with, you know, university groups, with local community groups, with schools, with land cares, with other organisations to, you know, help support each other, to leverage of each other, to share each other's message. So there is, you know, this louder, more unified voice, because at the end of the day, I think, you know, most of us, we want the same thing. 
We want, you know, a happy family with, you know, well-fed bellies. We want a beautiful environment we can enjoy. We want a stable community with meaningful jobs. So if we all want the same thing, how do we work more effectively together to actually get there? Yeah, absolutely. So when when uh, coronavirus and the pandemic and panic buying happened here in Australia, there was a lot of uh, empty shelves all of a sudden through people worried about having enough food. And then we also saw a lot of communication happening around actually here in Australia, we do get most of our food locally. We aren't going to run out of food. But what about this issue of food security globally and and you know us contributing to food security in other countries but as well as you know food security issues that farmers have to deal with how do you kind of bring that into your your the whole problem of agriculture given that we're starting this global conversation here on Sympatico? Yeah, so COVID-19 highlighted that disconnect between urban communities and farmers and food production very well, because as you say, in Australia, we are actually quite a, a food secure country. Farmers make up less than 1% of the population, but we provide around 93% of the food consumed here. But when COVID uh, started to happen in those first initial weeks, there was this panic buying and the supermarket shelves were going bare. And it's, it's a trend across the world that, you know, there's an increasingly urban population who are becoming further and further disconnected from the food producers. And so this is something we, you know, desperately need to correct. We actually need to bring these people closer together. We need people in the cities, in these urban environments to actually understand where their food is coming from, who's involved in producing it, how is it being produced? Um, and yes, sorry, your last bit of the question. <laughs> so I'll slip my mind. Oh, I, I, no, it was a big question. I have a habit of doing that. Um, I was just um, wondering about uh, the role when it comes to food security globally, because obviously we have, more than enough and other countries are in quite food insecure um, positions and that means you're more reliant on other countries like Australia and, and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, food security is a, a huge topic. So if we look at the global landscape, um, around 8 million people globally go hungry, around 2 billion people uh, have overnourishment, so we're at risk of overweight, over de um, overweight and being obese. Um, we also have, you know, a third of food being wasted globally. That's enough per year to feed about 3 billion people. So the food system is, is pretty broken in that we're not consuming food well. A lot of it's being wasted. We have, you know, these extremes of, you know, some people not being, being able to access enough food and, you know, the proper nutrients. And so you see, um, you know, childhood stunting and these terrible impacts of not actually getting enough, you know, micronutrients. And then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have people who are consuming too much, too many nutrients and leading to health related diseases and problems, which are, you know, are then straining healthcare systems and society. So we desperately need to work out food security and food consumption, um, both in Australia and globally. We need to make sure that we're eating the right things, we're eating um, you know, them well, and they are being produced in a manner that is not degrading the environment. Yeah, we've got um, Sarah on the chat just saying it seems like a lot of these numbers haven't really budged for a long time. Um, and she says, as long as I can remember, we've been wasting about a third of all food produced. And I know from a waste perspective, when that goes to landfill and the methane created again, we talk about methane in livestock, but also methane in food waste and landfill. And landfill, it then again goes to contribute to climate change. That's a big question from Sarah. How can we solve this problem? Is farmers for climate action looking to go global with what you're doing? Um, we're not going global at the moment. We're sort of focusing on Australia and, you know, um, at helping Australian farmers and, you know, working on Australian politics and industries to 
better it here at the moment. But we've seen other groups popping up in other countries. So there's Pakistan Farmers for Climate Action, which has modeled themselves on Australian Farmers for Climate Action, which is fantastic. So these groups do exist and are popping up around the place. And, you know, we're absolutely here to support and encourage and, um, you know, help where we can. Uh, in regards to food waste also, I think, again, this is an, another part of the, the puzzle in this disconnect between urban and rural um, peoples, in that if you are very disconnected from the food produced and you don't quite understand or appreciate the time, the resources, the labour, the, the effort that went into producing that food, it is actually very easy to you know, scrape off the leftovers into the bin at the end of a meal. But if you actually understand the, the farming story a bit better, if you have heard, you know, the farmer's passion of, you know, um, you know, producing crops, of seeing that be grown to understand the nutrients that go into the soil and, you know, the water resources that go into, um, you know, producing that, that beef or that corn or that apple, then you are so much more likely to finish that meal. And so, again, it comes back to, you know, this communication, this storytelling, bringing people together to understand, you know, these are very big and complex topics, but we all are part of this intricate web of connections. And so we all play a very important role in solving these problems that it faces. Awesome. I think that's a great note to leave it on. Thank you so much for, for joining me in our first ever Climate Australia episode. And I'm sure this is a discussion about agriculture and climate change that will continue not just here in Australia, but elsewhere. And I hope you'll have time to stick around just for a minute or two for, for some just chatting time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lee, for having me on. Thank you.